coming up on today's Locked On Dodgers, the Dodgers swept the Marlins. They beat the Cy Young frontrunner in Sandy Alcantara, and they did it all with good offense over the weekend and really good starting pitching. We'll get into all that, and we'll talk a little bit about Will Smith, who's been not one of the best hitting catchers in baseball, one of the best hitters in baseball. That's what's on tap, so make sure to keep it Locked On Dodgers. You are Locked On Dodgers. Your daily Los Angeles Dodgers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Yo, 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 Dodger fans. Welcome to Locked On Dodgers, where they sweep teams. This is the daily podcast covering the Dodgers. And I am Vince Amperio. That's Jeff Snyder. If you've never seen the show, we are both lifelong Dodger fans that have spent time covering the Dodgers in a variety of ways, continue to cover the Dodgers in a variety of ways. One of those ways being this podcast where we come to you every weekday, Monday through Friday, for about 30 minutes. Uh, we are part of the Locked On Podcast Network, which is the number one local sports daily podcast network. Locked On, your team every day. And Jeff, the Dodgers swept the Marlins. It was a series where you thought if they could win the first two to win the series, uh, then Sunday you, you maybe weren't as sure about because it was Ryan Pepio, who is a mixed bag at this point, so you don't know exactly what you're going to get. And they're facing the Cy Young frontrunner, Sandy Alcantara, who has dominated most teams this year and has thrown more innings than anybody else in baseball. Well, the Dodgers did not allow him to throw that many innings and did not allow him to pitch very well. And they actually pushed him behind Tony Gonsolin for ERA on the season, although he's thrown about 50 more innings than Gonsolin still. But either way, it was one of those games that helped the Dodgers win and sweep, uh, helped Tony Gonsolin's case a little bit, and also just uh, one of those games where it was fun to be a Dodger fan. There's a lot of those games recently, and that's where we talk about here on this podcast is the Dodgers being fun. Yeah, absolutely. It was a, it was a fun weekend. We kind of got – three different kinds of games, you know, uh, Friday night was a kind of a classic pitchers duel and it was suspenseful until the very end. Both pitchers, you know, had six shutout innings. Each one allowed a run in the seventh inning. Uh, Jesus Lazardo is really good. He's been a guy who's scared me ever since he came up with the A's. His stuff is really good. So it wasn't surprising that the Dodgers struggled, especially because Dodgers aren't quite as good as against lefties as they are against righties. Uh, that's my understatement for today. Um, but you know, the, for them to pull out that win, and there's plenty to talk about from that one. Our, our Monday shows are always packed, especially when the Dodgers have a weekend sweep. You know, and the and then Saturday's game, we were expecting another tough pitching matchup. Braxton Garrett, who is another tough lefty, uh, and then we found out just a few hours before the game he was on the injured list, and instead we got a dude making his major league debut who uh, had bad stats at AAA and doesn't strike anybody out. And the Dodgers did exactly what you would expect them to to do against a guy in that situation to the point where. It was actually a little bit sad. Uh, if we had known that the that the Marlins weren't going to score, I, I would have been okay with the Dodgers just letting off the gas after Will Smith threw on homer in the first inning and let the kid, you know, not totally destroy his major league dreams all at once. Uh, yeah, and then Sunday, it, it was kind of, we were expecting the Lazardo type, you know, close pitchers duel, and instead we got the major league de debut type uh, shellacking, as they say. Yeah, we'll get into all the offense, but the starting pitching is where we want to start off here first. Obviously, you mentioned Friday. Pitcher's duel on the side of the Dodgers was Tyler Anderson, who went seven innings and just gave up the one run. And then Saturday, we had the long-awaited season debut for Dustin May. And after a first inning in which he threw 25 pitches but didn't allow a run, loaded the bases, uh, punctuated with the big strikeout, he ended up throwing about 47, 48 pitches uh, in the net over the next four innings and striking out a bunch of Marlins along the way to just show that, you know, Destiny is back and healthy and get us maybe a little bit more excited than we already were for him to be in this rotation, uh, especially moving forward into October. And then Sunday, we got the, like I mentioned, the mixed bag that is Ryan Pepio. He ran into a little trouble in the first inning. Joey Gallo helped him out with a nice throw to, to home plate to nail a runner to end the inning. And then he settled in after that and ended up going six innings, which is a welcome sign for him. And, you know, all this pitching, you can come with the caveat of the Marlins are one of the worst offensive teams in baseball. And, you know, they've struggled against a lot of people this season. But 
You can only play who's in front of you. And the fact of the matter is all the Dodger pitchers did well. So even if it is against the worst offense, they did what they're supposed to do, uh, which is all you can really ask for. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, Dave Roberts after the game on Sunday kind of drew parallels between Dustin May and and uh, Ryan Pepio in that they both struggled in the first inning, threw a lot of pitches uh, and, you know, kind of Pepio, you could say he got bailed out by by Gallo's great throw. May got himself out of the jam, but either way, uh, it was it was a very similar performance that they both struggled in the first inning and then settled down and Pepio looked really, really good. And, you know, one of my favorite moments of the year so far was Ryan Pepio in the sixth inning. He gave up a leadoff single. It's his first time ever pitching in the sixth inning, sixth inning in the major leagues, gives up a leadoff single. And, you know, Dave Roberts, after Tuesday's start by Pepio, Roberts was actually a little bit blunt in his assessment of Pepio. He, he said, uh, he needs better fastball command. He needs to keep working on that. And the changeup, which was his best pitch, has taken a few steps back. And that is, for Dave Roberts to say that in the media, that's that's a pretty blunt assessment. And so I thought it was really cool for Roberts to then show his his confidence and, and recognize that, that Pepio was, after that first inning, he was pitching a lot better. He had you know a couple innings that were really, really good. And so to let him go back out for the sixth, and to not just send him out with a short leash, but actually say, you know what, we've got a lead. I want to see what this guy can do. And so he, he got the first out. And the, even then you thought, okay, maybe he just wants to bring him out on a high note. So he gets that first out and let's get him out of there, get him his round of, of applause. And Roberts was standing there on the top step. I don't know if he was actually thinking about taking him out or if he just wanted to uh, increase the drama, but whatever it was, it did. And Pepio kind of looked over at him and Roberts gave him a, a clap and a let's go. And, you know, stepped off the top step and back behind the railing where his, his perch is. And I don't think it's a coincidence that Pepio after that threw a bunch of strikes, you know, he threw five or six more pitches, pretty much all strikes, including two really good changeups to Brian Anderson and the changeup you know, was the thing that Roberts was most critical of. It was Pepio's best pitch in the minors. It's a pitch that Keith Law has said is one of the best changeups in baseball, not just among prospects, but everyone in professional baseball. Ryan Pepio's changeup is one of the best. And he threw two really good ones to Brian Anderson and then threw a fastball by him to strike him out. Gets a weak ground out by Miguel Rojas to finish the outing. And I think that even though Pepio is probably going back to the minors now, we haven't heard for sure uh, but chances are he's going back to the minors. Uh, it, it's a great note for him to go down on because I, I think there's some confidence there and recognizing, oh, I can throw this change up for strikes, throw it in the strike zone. It's got enough movement. It's going to be hard for them to hit. I don't need to get them to chase it as much as I've been trying to do. I think there's going to be a lot of benefits there. And it was, it was one of my, I, I actually got teary eyed and maybe it's the old man dad in me, but I, I kind of, teared up a little bit watching that whole exchange and just knowing what it's going to do for Pepio's confidence. Yeah, Jeff, that's definitely the, the old man daddy need because uh, someday I mean, you'll, you'll have something you love <laughs> in life, Vince, and yeah. you know, you'll understand. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. Pepio's issue has been the, the command control, throwing the ball in the strike zone, uh, having that, you know, confidence in throwing his pitches. So he's done well. Other than that, he hasn't really been hit too hard and, and, and things like that. It's really kind of been, letting guys get on base and then those guys end up scoring, but you get to back to Dustin May and, you know, it was kind of what we expected. He was a guy who came in throwing hard and through some of the, you, you go to RPM, which is revolutions per minute. If I'm not mistaken, uh, it's basically the spin on the ball and Dustin May had three of the five highest RPM strikeout pitches in 2022. He had We'll just go to the numbers real quick. He had two pitches over 3,400 RPM. Uh, no one else has thrown that much for a strikeout pitch this year. Charlie Morton was number three with 3,354. Then Dustin May was right under him with 3,314. And then Charlie Morton again under him with 3,311. So actually three of the top four. And he threw some, you know, a, a few over three, you know, three, 3,400, whatever it is. Uh, and if that's what he's coming back with, uh, just watch out because before he – got hurt you know his issue was a little bit getting deep into games because he didn't miss a lot of bats but he did throw a lot of pitches he wasn't getting those strikeouts he was starting to get better at it then he got hurt and he came back and he was getting strikeouts on fastballs he's getting strikeouts on that slider uh he has a change up now that he didn't incorporate too much but he can incorporate 
And, you know, it's hard to not get giddy and excited over what we saw because, like I said, it, yes, the Marlins aren't a good hitting team. But the fact of the matter is the stuff was good. And if the stuff looks like that, uh, you know, the Dodgers might be okay even with Walker Buehler being out the rest of the season. Yeah, and obviously you don't want to get too excited about Dustin May. You want to have that caution, whether it's health reasons, whether it's, you know, this is just the Marlins. But uh, the stuff looked really, 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 really good. And it's hard not to be pretty happy about that unless you're Dylan Hernandez. Yeah, we'll get into the offensive side of things. The first bet online, betonline.net is the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your betting needs. Find all your favorite sports and events at the number one online source for odds, lines, and games. They got reviews and news of every league, including MLB, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, and even golf. Bet Online continues to be the top online resource for your sports wagering information from live in game betting scores and podcasts. They got you covered. Head to Bet Online today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening. Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, Jeff. So we talked about starting pitching. The bullpen has been really good also, uh, but we may not have time to get to them this episode. But we want to get into the offense. And it was one of those weekends where Dodgers swept, but they got contributions pretty much from everywhere up and down the lineup. Uh, Maybe a little bit unlikely coming up against the guy in in Alcantara on Sunday where you got a triple from Joey Gallo, which nearly was a home run. And then Cody Bellinger seemingly hit one the same exact way Gallo did, just a little bit further, which was a home run. Uh, And that's the way the Dodgers got two of the the six runs they got off Alcantara. So it was one of those, you know, obviously Mookie, Freddie, Trey continue to do their thing at the top. Max Muncy added another home run. You know, he's continued to stay hot in August. Will Smith, who we're going to get into a little bit more in depth uh, here later in this segment. But it was one of those where top to bottom, the Dodgers offense was rolling and it just goes to show that, uh, yeah, these guys can hit. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody on the starting lineup had at least one hit on Sunday. Five different guys had multiple hits, including two guys with three hits each. Uh, The 10 runs they put up, actually, it could have very easily been 11 because uh, Will Smith's RBI double would have scored two if it hadn't bounced over the wall. Uh, they got a little bit of bad luck that it bounced over the wall, stranded Trey Turner at third when he would have easily scored, uh, may have been able to score twice on that. Um, and, and yeah, it was just a really, really dominant offensive display. And I didn't say this out loud because I didn't want to to be bad luck. Like, I don't believe in jinxes, but I respect them, you know, uh, kind of like how I feel about Padres fans. I don't believe they exist, but I respect the idea, you know? Um, And I I was kind of confident about the Dodgers going up against Alcantara just because he doesn't get a ton of strikeouts, not nearly as many strikeouts as you would expect with a guy, the stuff he has, um, his his strikeout rate is kind of pedestrian this year. And the Dodgers are a team that if you can't strike them out, they're probably going to get their hits against you. And, and that's what we saw. And it it's what the Dodgers have done against him several times in the last few years. And, and they'll get a chance again next weekend to, to face Alcantara in Mi- Miami and, you know, see if they can do it again. But, uh, yeah, they, they put on a really good display. They only – I mean, they struck out 10 times in this game, but I think most of those were probably – I'd have to – Look, Alcantara didn't have a ton of strikeouts. He had five strikeouts in three and two-thirds innings, uh, which is actually more than he usually has. Uh, and if you look at uh, actual – that's why strikeouts uh, K per nine is a weird stat because uh, Alcantara faced 22 batters and only struck out five of them. So uh, the Dodgers did a really good job putting the putting the ball in play, putting the bat on the ball, and good things are going to happen when you have hitters as good as them putting the ball in play – you know, Joey Gallo, if he hits the ball, chances are it's going to be hit hard somewhere. If Cody Bellinger hits it, he's got the power to hit it hard somewhere. All these guys, you know, the, the big issue is for Gallo and Bellinger and Muncy earlier in the season and, you know, Lux at times, uh, Chris Taylor obviously is the strikeout. And when if you can't strike them out a lot, you're not going to have a lot of success against them. You're muted. Yeah, that's really how it goes in. Uh you know, maybe a bit of a jinx. Uh, Dylan Hernandez wrote an article after the game about how this Dodgers team can hit good pitching. And he talked to Don Mattingly, and Don Mattingly kind of mentioned and reminds him of some of those Yankee teams that he was a hitting coach for in the early 2000s. And 
basically how the way you have to attack them is just go after them. Like actually attack them, you know, throw strikes, try to get those strikeouts, swing them, to try to get them in, in counts where they don't, where they have to think about it a little more. And he mentioned the angels back in that time of, of their pitching staff and how they, that's how they handled the Yankees. They took the Yankees out twice uh, in some of those years in the playoffs and, yeah, you think about that, and and you would think that Alcantara, although he doesn't get the strikeouts, he does get, you know, he he does go after you guys, and obviously he stays deep in the games. He's gone into the seventh inning a bunch of times this year, so you thought that, you know, he might have a chance, but clearly he didn't have a chance. The Dodgers got to him early and often, and you look at Joey Gallo now. He's, he's with the Dodgers in, in 12 games, 30 at-bats, sitting 267 with the OPS over 1,000. He's got those three home runs. He's got four RBIs. He still struck out 14 times in 30 at bats, which is not great. But the part is with the Yankees, he was striking out a lot and not producing when he did hit the ball. This time now he's producing when he doesn't hit. And if he's gonna, you know, hit the ball with the OPS over a thousand and half his at bats and half his at bats are strikeouts, I think the Dodgers will take that at this point. Cody Bellinger had that reset, you know, didn't really come back and, and light the world on fire, but he can. You know, with him, the Dodgers just need him to have competitive at bats, good at bats, and run into one every once in a while. And that's what he did. He ran into one and he got the hit. Uh, and then, you know, the top of the order had just dominated Sunday. Top of the order dominated on Saturday. Justin Turner had a big three run home run. Will Smith had a big three run home run. And I guess it's into a question that we had about Will Smith from a listener email uh, from Brian Ashinomi. Uh, apologies if that was pronounced wrong, but. He says, how good is Will Smith offensively? He hears all the time that he's one of the best hitting catchers in baseball, but he says that may be a cop-out for best hitting catchers. Uh, He says most teams would would be happy with Barnes because he calls a good game, frames well, plays good defense. But Smith, as a hitter, bats fourth on arguably the best team in baseball. He wants us to help him out to put it in context with other hitters, not just catchers. And Jeff, you are our statistician on this podcast, and I know you have some numbers for us. Yeah. And uh, I definitely get Brian's point. And I, I feel like it, it kind of, it goes both ways. The reason I, I think you hear best hitting catcher more often than you hear uh, best hitting first baseman, uh, because catcher is a position uh, you, you hear it more on positions where there is a defensive premium. You'll hear best hitting shortstop more than you'll hear best hitting right fielder because shortstop's a harder position to play. And so getting offense from those positions, uh, people like me are old enough to remember when teams didn't care about getting any offense at all from their shortstops and their catchers, because it was just accepted. You know, Omar Vizquel, people think he should be in the Hall of Fame. The dude couldn't hit. He, you know, his career OPS plus is like 87. Uh, Ozzie Smith, for most of his career, he became a decent hitter at the end of his career. Most of his career, he was making all-star teams every single year, despite being a terrible hitter, except against Tom Deedon Fewer in the 1985 NLCS. I don't want to talk about it. Thank you very much. Uh, you know, you didn't expect that. And the same with, even more so with catchers. You know, Mike Sosha, Dodgers legend. Dude couldn't hit, had no power. Just, you know, he, he didn't strike out much. He he was a He was a good hitter, but not a he wouldn't be a good hitter by today's standards. And, and that was kind of the, the era that I grew up in. And so I think some of the reason that we hear things like good hitting catcher, or good hitting shortstop is because of that legacy of not expecting the offense from them. But if you look at, at Will Smith, not compared to other catchers, but compared to all of baseball, uh, his OPS plus coming into Sunday, this is actually, it's going to be higher. Now his OPS plus was 128 coming into Sunday. Uh, he had, three more hits and uh, yeah, three hits, including a double. And so his OPS and OPS plus went up on Sunday. Uh, and so it'll be a little bit higher, but coming in on Sunday, it was 128, which puts him tied for 37th best hitter in baseball. This is among people with at least 300 plate appearances. So I, I lowered the bar a little bit from, from qualifying for the batting title, uh, but it looks like only a couple guys sneak in there, there, but uh you know, basically 37th best hitter in baseball among all positions, 30 teams, meaning that he is, you know, he, he would be in the top two players on any given team uh, as far as hitting goes. And that is pretty darn impressive, especially for a catcher. And so for me, I do think Brian's right that maybe when we're talking about Will Smith, uh, yeah, he is one of the best hitting catchers in baseball, but more to the point, he is one of the best hitters in baseball who happens to be a catcher. And so it's even more impressive 
Uh, and obviously he does play some DH and, and th there's a lot of uh, value there to letting him be the DH once in a while. But yeah. Will Smith is a great hitter period, or as they say in England, full stop. Uh, and if you're talking about for a catcher, you don't need that qualifier on Will Smith. Yeah. And if you go to OPS currently with qualified hitters, he's top 20, he's 18. So, you know, he's a, a thing that by OPS top 18 in baseball among qualified hitters, OPS plus among the parameters, Jeff said with 300 at bats, you know, top 40 in baseball. So like, yes, he is one of the a better, he's one of the best hitters in baseball, not just by catcher. And, you know, after a, a slow start and then just, you know, back to normal Will Smith numbers, he's turning into more than what even we thought of. You know, we saw the comparisons, the start of his career with Mike Piazza's career, and they were very similar. And, you know, at this point, Will Smith comes up. You just expect him to have a, a good at bat. And most of the time, those good at bats end in a hit, especially if it's a two out, you know, first inning. Perfect example on Sunday, uh, two outs, runner in scoring position. Will Smith knocks the run in. You know, later on, two outs again. Later in the game, kind of to, to extend the lead, you know, drops a single into left field. And, yeah, it's been fun to watch him continue to blossom. And it's good that he's getting reps in DH because, you know, the Dodgers have another catcher coming up through the ranks that could also help out there. Uh, and he was recently named by MLB Pipeline the number one prospect in the Dodgers system and a top 10 prospect in all of baseball. So uh, the Dodgers, uh, you know, are blessed in a lot of ways uh, in terms of offensive production from the catcher standpoint. Yeah. One last note on Will Smith that you kind of hinted at is that he's had a little bit of bad luck and you know, that slow start you mentioned had to do with a lot of bad luck and uh, he still has some of that. If you look at his slugging percentage is uh, 479 his expected slugging percentage based on the quality of contact is 498. So he's actually still, it, the numbers are catching up, but he still overall has had some bad luck this year. And so uh, he's, he's probably even a better hitter than the numbers show. And the numbers show that he is one of the best hitters in baseball. Yeah. All right. Dodgers got some arms coming back. We're going to get into that for uh, So, but thank you for making lockdown Dodgers your first listen of the day every day. And we're back. Um, all right, Jeff. So real quick, we, we touched on the Dodgers against Sandy and how that was going to be, you know, how you thought it, it could work out. Um, you know, him, Sandy had himself questioning a little bit, you know, where the dot was he tipping? Did the Dodgers find something, uh, you know, when, when you're doing that well and a team gets you like this and a team that's been rolling, uh, that's something you may think. Uh, fortunately for him, maybe, uh, because I'm sure he has a competitive fire and, uh, maybe fortunately or unfortunately for the Dodgers, we'll have to wait and see. The Dodgers are probably going to face him again on Friday or Saturday when the Dodgers head to Miami this weekend. Is you know, it's one of those where we don't know what to expect, but uh, it's good to see like two times through against the same guy, you know, just to see what the barometer is for the Dodgers on this offense. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's hard to tell what to expect to happen there. Um, if if a pitcher had dominated the Dodgers, like if the Dodgers faced Lizardo again, I would expect them to actually do a little bit better because seeing him for the second time in, in such a short amount, uh, I would think that they would be a little more familiar. I don't know if the same thing works the other way as far as expecting Alcantara to have better luck against the Dodgers, seeing them for the second time, or if, you know, the, the hitter familiarity with the pitcher, I would think would be more important. And so, I definitely don't expect the Dodgers to score six runs and knock him out of the game in the fourth inning again. Uh, but I don't expect Alcantara to really benefit here from seeing them a second time, you know, probably get better luck and, and just, you know, the, the ups and downs of baseball. I really think that most of the time when you have a team that, you know, doesn't score and then scores a bunch. And, you know, I think that mostly has to do with baseball is a hard sport. Baseball is a weird sport. And on any given day, guys can get hot or not. And, uh, and I think that's probably the case with Alcantara too. And so, yeah, just by the nature of luck and, and baseball, he'll probably do better than he did uh, on Sunday when he faces them on Friday or whenever it is. But I don't expect it to be significantly easier for him. And I, I think the Dodgers are a really good hitting team, especially against a guy like Alcantara. I don't know if you saw the stats during the game that the Dodgers have outstanding numbers on hard fastballs this year. Uh, they're They're batting like, 
pushing 320 against fastballs that are 98 miles an hour or more. And Alcantara throws really hard. And, and so uh, he doesn't strike out as many guys as, as you think he should, like we talked about before. Uh, so people are putting the bat on the ball and the team putting the bat on the ball is a team that when they hit hard fastballs, they generally hit them pretty darn well. And so it might just be that Alcantara is the kind of pitcher who the Dodgers are going to do okay against, even though the rest of the league doesn't. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens there, but on the Dodgers side, pitching wise, we got a lot of updates this weekend. Obviously we saw Dustin May come back. Bruzar Gratterall was supposed to be back with him this weekend, but uh, one of the games in OKC got rained out and the Dodgers wanted to see him throw one more time. So now he's expected to join on Monday. Clayton Kershaw is expected to throw a bullpen sin game and would not need a rehab assignment. So he may be back soon. Like Trinan is, uh, has a tentative date of September 2nd to return. So he's going to continue to get, you know, some, some throws down there in OKC, probably a back to back. I would imagine somewhere in there just to, you know, make sure he's good. Danny Duffy, who we thought we weren't going to see, and we probably still might not see, but, uh, the setback that he had just turned out to be soreness. He pitched and started a game in Arizona. He pitched one inning. So, uh, yeah, that we'll have to see what happens there. Victor Gonzalez uh, is in OKC, and he's starting his rehab assignment. So a lot of names for the Dodgers that are due back soon. Three for sure, and Gratterall, Kershaw, and Trinan that are guaranteed spots on the roster, and two guys that are a little bit of wild cards. And at the very least, they're going to push Vessia and Ferguson over these next few weeks to, you know, just to keep them, keep them honest a little bit. Yeah, for sure. I'm really interested interested to see what the Dodgers do with Gratterall coming back today. Uh, as we're recording this on Sunday evening, we haven't heard, you know, I assume the, the announcement will come out, you know, several hours after we drop this episode about what they're doing to make the roster spot for Gratterall. Um, you know, they, they just, uh, when they activated Dustin May, they DFA'd Reyes Maranta. Uh, so we don't know if he's staying in the, in the organization or not. Um, and kind of the the natural assumption is that they'll send Pepio down uh, because they are they do have six starters right now. I don't hate the idea though of sticking with six starters, and I wouldn't be surprised to see Bickford get option. One of the guys who has options, and and I I think we're mostly at Bickford right now. I can't think of uh, anybody else in the Dodgers' current bullpen who has options available, and so it's probably Bickford. And, and when Bickford threw two innings on Saturday, I thought, oh, that might be. Okay, let's let's get use them up and then send them down for a little while uh, because, you know, both because the six man rotation is helpful and because Pepio is coming up on the limit of number of times you can be optioned in a season, which is a new rule this year. He's been optioned three times already. Uh, you can only be optioned five times. So if they option him uh, today, that would be his fourth. And then they're down to just one more, which, you know, would probably be fine. But we've still got 40 something games left with some health concerns among starters. And so it might make sense to keep him on the roster, not just because the six-man rotation is nice right now, but because you don't want to waste those options. And so I wouldn't be surprised to see Bickford go down. And, and Vince, I want to get your thoughts on one thing. You know, the, the, the postseason schedule came out, and there's not a day off in the NLDS between games four and five like there normally was and there's not a day off in the NLCS between games five and six like there normally was. And so every team is going to need four starting pitchers. But with the Dodgers having, if everybody's healthy, would you kick around the idea of going with five starters in the postseason? And because you know nobody stands out as this guy has to be our game one starter every series. Uh, and, and, you know, in 2020, when they didn't have any days off, the Dodgers actually ran into some issues because they thought, well, we might need four starters or five starters in a series. So we got to, and, and so you end up with Tony Gonsolin pitching when he hadn't pitched in 22 days or whatever, because they swept the NLDS against the Padres. So he didn't get the pitch. And then, so he, you know, when he did pitch, he was rusty, but if the Dodgers just went with regular five man rotation and it's like, Oh, okay. Okay. We swept the NLDS. Well, then our fourth starter is starting game one of the NLCS. And just kind of when you've got so many starters who've been really, really good this year and also kind of bunched together in quality and such a good offense, 
do you just keep getting these guys rest? You let them get an extra day of rest on the series that do have a day off and just say, we're going with our regular rotation and we're trusting our offense and, and our pitchers to just say, we're just going to score a bunch and keep you to few runs and we're going to win the world series this way. Yeah. Uh, one quick note on Pepio, just what they might be thinking with the day off Thursday, that's kind of like having the six starter through this time around. And then at the end of the 10 days, if they wanted to call him back up, that's available or Kershaw might be back by that time. So it could be a matter of, you know, we'll keep Pepio down until we need him, which is obviously, you know, like playing with fire a little bit because once they do call him back up, if they need him, he's going to have to stick around. But either way, uh, that might be another train of thought there. But yeah, on the, on the other side, I mean, we talked about before maybe carrying an extra starting pitcher and having a piggyback type of start, you know, if may and, you know, Tyler Anderson's already done it, so we know he could be able to handle it. And a May, Tyler Anderson would just be a funny contradiction of, of pitching styles uh, in a game four to, or whatever, game three, whatever it is. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, it, it's one of those where it's going to become a pitching staff. And I think, you know, Julio Kershaw, for sure, one, two, in some combination, if they're both healthy, that's probably a given. If Gonsling keeps it up, you know, theoretically, he's going to finish top five, for, at least for Cy Young. So you kind of want to give them that run. But, yeah, I mean, it's a matter of you take – I think you take the extra arm and then you deploy it as you need it. So if you have, you know, Anderson, May, Heaney, or a combination of those two or all three, uh, I think you bring them along. And like you said, you deploy it as needed. I do think it would benefit them to get Heaney and Anderson a couple relief, you know, maybe get them in the inning a relief or have an opener for them and let them figure out, you know, how to come in in relief. Uh, you know, Anderson's done it. I'm pretty sure Heaney's probably done it at some point in his career, but either way. Uh, but yeah, I think you bring those arms because realistically you already have those arms when Trenton and, and Gratter all come back, it's big third, and then they have to make another decision. That's where the David Price might come into play or something like that. But yeah, I'm, I'm all on board for taking the extra starting pitching arm and deploying it as necessary. And, you know, depending on who you play, you can be a little matchup dependent on those last couple guys because, you know, if, if right-handers fare, fare better, then, okay, you get May and or, – or, I mean, they have a lot of lefties, so you get May. But uh, if lefties or soft-tossing lefties fare better, I know the Mets are not good against lefties. They have a very low OPS against lefties. So if you play the Mets and you get Julio, Kershaw, Anderson, and Heaney, and then you have Dustin May as a swing guy, that's another way to go about it. So, yeah, I'm all for bringing that extra arm the pitching on the pitching side and just going about it how you need it. Yeah, and you could always adjust. Hey, we're up three games and none in the NLCS. All right, we'll do a piggyback start today and go for the jugular. You know, uh, you're going to see three different guys for three innings each of different styles or whatever. Um, and, and one last thought on the Pepio thing. The five options is – that means they could option him. That would be the fourth. Call him back up, option him again, and call him back up again. They just couldn't send him down yeah. after that one. And so so they could still call him back two more times this season. And so, yeah, they they – Real, realistically, they're probably not going to run into issues with the option thing. Uh, and if they do, it'll be because of an injury and they might, they probably wouldn't want to have to send him back down anyway. And there's always Andre Jackson you can call up if you just need an emergency starter, Andre Jackson or Michael Grove, I guess. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think we got it all from the weekend or as much as we want. Like I said, the bullpen, I don't think well, they allowed a run today, Price did, but they hadn't allowed a run in a while before that. Uh, they're continuing to roll. Um, but like I said, with Gratterall coming and training coming in a week or like 10 days or so, uh, there will be a couple decisions that have to be made. But we'll cross that bridge when we get there. You got anything else, uh, Jeff? Uh, no. Every Monday episode could be an hour long, and uh, we're pushing 34 minutes right now, which is already four minutes longer than David Locke wants these to be. So we apologize to our listeners. Hope you listen to the end. Uh, it really, as long as you guys promise to always listen to the end, we won't get in too much trouble for going over every once in a while. So just make sure you listen to the end because they see those numbers. But, yeah, that's all I got today. Yep, that's going to do it for today's episode. Thank you all for listening. Thanks for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen of the day every day. Check out Locked On MLB with our, Paul, with our pal, Sully. Uh, he's also every weekday morning, Monday through Friday. The number one daily league-wide podcast is Locked On MLB. And check him out wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. You can find us wherever you get podcasts and on YouTube. You can find us on social media. Twitter and Instagram at Locked On Dodgers. Jeff is on Twitter at Snydog. I'm at Vince Samperio. DMs are open on all those accounts. If you have questions, comments, concerns, uh, all those good things, you can also send those via email, like Brian did. 
of LockedOnDodgers at gmail.com, or you can send it via voicemail text at 323-863-5625. We're here every weekday morning, and we hope you'll be with us when you get in your car. If you're at home, tell your smart device play podcast, Locked On Dodgers. And remember, you don't have to agree. You just have to listen. Have a good one. We'll talk to you tomorrow.